Hey everyone, how's it going? Forrest here, again with another installment of my complete analysis of all of JS Box Corral harmonizations. Today we're looking at Yesu Nunsaik Pleisit, which translates to Jesus Now Be Praised. This is a very long corral, it has a lot of content in it, it's not just a corral that occupies a lot of real estate on the page. It is a two-pager, but there's a lot to talk about, so I think we're just going to hop right into the analysis. Um, two sharps in the key signature, we start on D, we end on D. I reckon we're in the key of D major, however, our first phrase ends in an imperfect authentic cadence in C major. Very fascinating. So after our tonic triad, we have D, D, A, and F sharp again. No need to reanalyze. Passing tone in the tenor before we get D, F sharp, A, and D. Another D major triad, no need to reanalyze. We get C sharp, E, A, and E to start us off in this uh, chromatically descending half-step progression here in the bass. That's A major over C sharp, which is 5, 6. We then have C natural, D, A, and F sharp. This is D7 over C, which would be 5, 4, 2 of 4, because D is the dominant of G, and G is our 4. And then we go to B, D, G, and G, which is our 4 chord, and also our common chord in the key of C major, which is our 5. We have a passing tone in the alto before we get uh, A, G, B, and G. I reckon this A is an accented non-chord tone. Sorry, this is a 5-6 chord, and that is also a 4-6 chord. It's in first inversion because this chord right here is taking the triad and putting it in root position. So we'll just change the figure bass without reiterating the Roman numeral. And then we get C major, C, G, C, and E, which is our tonic triad. Okay, looking ahead, we have somewhat of a cadence here. There's no... Um, there's no fermata here, so we're going to call it like a moving cadence. The fact that the instruments that are also playing, sorry, I forgot to mention that this is a chorale that has instrumental interludes or instrumental accompaniment, but because we're only looking at the voices, uh, I've omitted them from the score. Um, but this is somewhat of a perfect authentic cadence, um, and I do believe we have... There's a couple of different ways we can interpret this E major chord here. I'm saying that we have a direct modulation to D major here, and this is just setting us up for a tonicization of our dominant. E major over G sharp would be 5, 6 of 5, and that goes to A major, A, C sharp, A, and E, which is our 5 chord. However, if you wanted to continue to analyze this in the key of C major, which I think is totally valid, you could say that this was 5, 6, of 6 because in the key of C major we do have an A chord but it's A minor um, and then in a deceptive fashion we could get the chord that we um, expect in the key we, we in a deceptive fashion in the sense that we wouldn't be getting A minor we get A major we could say that that's the point in which we modulate but I feel like it's more uh, likely that this C natural to G sharp leap is supposed to sort of signify a break between the two ideas. I mean, C major already feels like a huge departure from D major anyways. So uh, I, I think ultimately speaking, whether you call it a direct modulation, the majority of the modulations we're going to have throughout the first page are going to be direct because we don't know what the instruments are doing to set up modulations throughout, especially during these gaps. Um, this just felt direct to me, so that's how I chose to analyze it. But you could also analyze it continuing in the key of C as a secondary dominant chord that we get in an unexpected chord on the other side. We have a passing seventh in the bass before we get F sharp, D, A, and D. It's our tonic triad and first inversion. We get G, G, B, and D on the next beat. That's G major in root position, which is a four chord. Passing seventh in the tenor before we get A, E, A, and C sharp our tonic triad root position, and then our faux cadence. Um, this is, for all intents and purposes, a cadence. We see cadences that continue on into new phrases all the time in instrumental music, but because the phrases are more compartmentalized in the chorales, if there's a phrase that ends or something that feels like a phrase ending without a fermata and the material continues after the fact, um, I put the uh, cadence and um, or the the cadence classification in parentheses because it is its own separate idea well, not a separate idea but um, it's uh, visually different we don't have a marker on the page that just draws our eye to it I guess granted you could make the argument that the long note value and the gaps afterwards sort of feels like a cadence um, but still no fermatas and that's how I've been conventionalizing it uh, since I've started doing it so D major that's our tonic triad Okay, looking ahead, we have 
uh, somewhat of a complement to the first phrase, uh, or the first and second phrase, I guess. Um, I'm going to say that this is a direct modulation to the key of A. We could make the argument that A is a common chord, but this does feel like a separate idea, especially with so much space in between the two phrases. So I think this A major, you could call it a common chord between D and A. I'm just going to call it our tonic triad, A, C sharp, A, and E. We have some passing tones in the inner voices before we get A, C sharp, A, and E. Again, no need to reanalyze. A neighboring seventh in the bass and another neighbor tone in the tenor before we get A, C sharp, A, and E. Again, we're seeing a very similar progression as we did to the first phrase. Um, and then we have some passing tones going on here after our third tonic triad. We're left with B, D, G sharp, and E. That's E7 over B, which would be 5, 4, 3. Um, and then that would, we would expect that to go to some type of A major chord, which it does. Um, C sharp, E, A, and E, which is our tonic triad in first inversion. And uh, this A kind of puts the chord in root position, but because we're getting rid of the only third in the triad, I feel like it doesn't really contribute too much to the analysis by including it. Um, we then have D, D, A, and F sharp with this C natural, this anticip uh, anticipational, anticipatory, this anticipation of a C sharp or C natural here, which makes this feel like four, but it's also functioning in the key of G major as five, same way that we had G introduced here, and it also turned into our dominant chord that was two um, positions away on the circle of fifths going to, in this case, the left. Um, and then we get G major proper in root position here, G, C, A, and D. Actually, I say G major proper, but no, we actually get two suspensions. We get a 4-3 suspension in the tenor and a 9-8 suspension in the uh, alto before we get our chord tones uh, here, G and B. And then we have some neighbor tones, a neighboring seventh in the alto and a neighbor tone in the tenor, uh, leaving us with an imperfect authentic cadence in the key of G here. This feels like an imperfect authentic cadence, even though the reiterated chord is where we get it. I wouldn't look at this as a cadence that consisted of a one chord going to a one chord, but also with the C and the A, it kind of has plagal qualities. If you look at the cadence occurring over the span of these three beats, this really feels like five going to one to me. So I feel like this is the cadence and then the fact that we land on G after the fact feels like a little codetta maybe. Um, but yeah, I look at it as an imperfect authentic cadence. Maybe there's an argument that it's like a plagal cadence if you just look at these two, um, the, uh, these three beats rather. And then we conclude again with another sort of faux perfect authentic cadence, or it's really not a faux perfect authentic cadence, it's just different because it doesn't have a proper pause or separation due to the fermata uh, placement on the final chord of the cadence. But we start things off here with uh, F sharp, F sharp, A, and D, which is D major over F sharp. That's a 5-6 chord, and um, I think this is where we modulate back to the key of uh, D major. This is now our tonic in first inversion. We have a passing tone in the bass before we get A, E, A, and C sharp. That is our 5 chord. Sorry, not in first inversion. It's just in root position here with a passing 7th in the alto. And then we get B, D, F sharp, and D. This is a deceptive progression. Five going to six. This is B minor with a passing seventh in the bass. And then we get G, D, B, and E. That's E minor seven over G. That's a two, six, five chord. Bach loves two, six, five chords. And we would expect a five chord after this. A, C sharp, A, and E. That's exactly what we get, our five chord. This A leaping down to an A in the bass is still a chord tone, so we don't need to mark it. This G natural is a passing tone, or passing seventh more specifically, before we get D major, D, A, F sharp, and D, which is our tonic triad and root position. Okay, looking ahead, we have um, an interesting phrase. This one kind of uh, confuses me uh, with short phrases. Um, in this case, actually, I mean, this phrase is really no shorter than the first phrase, right? It's the exact same length. But something about it makes it feel like there's more content crammed into it. It has a very similar structure to the first phrase because of its length and because of what it's achieving. Um, but we get a very quick 
modulation, and I'm still not 100% certain as to what the um, where the modulation occurs. I feel like it's over a zone, but it's definitely using a chord that feels a little forced. It feels like um, the modulation has to occur very quickly, um, or this is just a subdominant cadence, one or the other. So this is an imperfect authentic cadence in the key of B minor, or a subdominant cadence, and this is one of those subdominant cadences that really does feel like we are um, cadencing on the fourth in the key of um, F sharp minor, but we arrive on um, B minor and it gets reiterated. So there's some conflict going on here from a um, vocabulary standpoint. Like, you know, what word do we really use to describe it? I feel like imperfect authentic cadence is fine, but. Um, modulating over a secondary dominant does feel a little forced. It's something that I try to avoid analyzing. Typically, if you have to modulate over a secondary dominant um, in the middle of a phrase, um, usually there is some sort of explanation as to why the modulation could occur earlier or later. Um, but in this case, it really does feel like the dominant chord is introducing the idea of B minor because it coincides with the cadence and you'll see that when we analyze it. So we start off with A major, A, E, A, and C sharp. I think again because of this long gap in between the phrases I feel like a direct modulation is happening here even though we could say that this A major chord is our five chord in the key of uh, D uh, I feel like we're in the key of F sharp. The same way that we have this long gap here and we go to A you could say that we have a common chord or you can call it a direct modulation. I feel like they're both uh, accurate analyses depending on how you look at the material. In this case, I look at it as its own separate idea because temporally there has been separation and um, thematically it feels like there's separation as well. The melody feels very different and um, the context in which A is being introduced feels like a new idea. There might even be an argument to be made that we're in the key of A right now, but I'm saying F sharp because I know what's immediately going to happen afterwards or close to immediately. So this A is our three chord in the key of F sharp, and then we get it again, A, E, A, and C sharp with a passing tone, well, or with two passing tones in the lower voices. We have this G sharp and this F sharp here. Before we get F, G sharp, B, and C sharp, I reckon this F sharp's an accent and non-chord tone, and what we actually get is C sharp major over E sharp, which is five, six, five, uh, 3 going to 5 has become a relatively common progression in box chorales. I wouldn't say that for the grand scheme of tonal music that 3 going to 5 is a normative progression, but for Bach, it's getting there. I think I need to see it with more regularity in order for that to be codified, but it, or in my eyes, for it to be codified. But uh, still, 3 going to 5, um, even though the chords are a third apart, they have very different functions and it feels like enough um, of a new, it, it just feels different. It feels different like in comparison to like a two going to a seven chord, for example. We see three go to five after separation all the time. Two going to seven, not so much, but it, it's sort of the same idea. Um, yes, uh, but we have this E sharp here, which is our chord tone, and then we get F sharp, F sharp, A natural, and C sharp. Now, I feel like this is where the modulation could begin. You could say that this is a minor 5 in the key of B minor. It just doesn't feel like that to me. It doesn't really feel like B minor gets introduced until we get this, um, well, this E natural is a passing 7th, of course. We then get uh, D, F sharp, A sharp, and C sharp. I do think, however, this D is an accented non-chord tone. Um, otherwise, this would be a D seven or D major seven with a sharp five um, and it's very possible that that's the case but I think this C sharps our chord tone this is actually a five six four of four which in the key of B minor is also our five six four chord and this is a passing six four it's an okay configuration to see but six four chords in the middle of a progression is very unusual and then we get B minor B F sharp B and D which is our tonic triad and then we get it again under the fermata. Now, the interesting thing is that I've actually gone back and looked at a lot of my older analyses, that is, like, you know, ones from three and a half, four months ago and older, and something that I was doing is I was analyzing over these um, instances where I was saying the 
secondary dominant was the chord in which we were modulating over. And I was surprised how many times that happened because after going back through the analyses, there was no reason why I couldn't just say that modulation occurred after the tonicization. There was never a reason that it need uh, like this one, for example, that the modulation, there's a strong argument for it to happen on the secondary dominant. Granted, this is a zone. We could say that this entire phrase is in the key of B minor if we wanted to, if we looked at it that way. But I think with the G sharp and the A natural, I think it's unlikely. Uh, and the fact that the A natural gets introduced so close to the cadence, it really does feel like a subdominant cadence. Um, kind of like how the first phrase feels like a... Um, like a once removed uh, secondary or subdominant cadence, because if this were a subdominant cadence in D, we would expect a cadence on G major, but Bach takes it a step further and gives it a mixolydian sound by cadencing on C major. And he does the same thing again in the next set of phrases in the A section, but still, modulating over a secondary dominant, it does happen. Very rarely, though, I would have uh, before going back through my old analyses, I would say that it happened far more commonly than it actually does. But the handful of times, um, maybe it's uh, something that I've analyzed like s no more than 10 times in all of the corrals, pro but probably less than that, probably closer to like six or seven times, but like no more than 10. Um, this is like maybe one of two instances where I think that it's legitimately justified that that is the point in which the modulation occurs. And that happens because uh, the, the cadence does feel like it's in the key of B minor and the modulation happens so close to the cadence. But depending on your relationship and how um, you feel like chords could fit into a tonal scheme, you could, you, you could say this whole phrase was in B minor and you could analyze the modulation pretty much up until that A sharp at any either one of these chords, the 565 five or the 1. So it's entirely up to you. Um, I feel like it's very quick and the analysis reflects that, the fact that the modulation is occurring over a, a chromatic chord. Um, I think that's pretty cool. But that's enough to say about that. We have a lot of corral to cover left. Um, we have a perfect authentic, or sorry, we have a, yeah, no, this is a perfect authentic cadence in the key of D major. Um, it's very interesting. We actually, we don't start things off with a modulation, but we kind of do. Um, immediately after our B minor chord, we have E, G, B, and C sharp. And that's C sharp minor 7 flat 5 over E, which is 2, 6, 5. Interesting to see a phrase start with a 2, 6, 5 chord. I don't think we've seen that, or I can't remember, so it's so infrequent that it's not something that's stuck with me. And then we have F sharp, G, B, and C sharp. That is uh, not an analog, that's like a sus chord. Um, so when we get rid of that F sharp and look at the G sharp, G sharp, G sharp, B, and C sharp, we're left with kind of like a 4-3 a chord. And because this is a diminished uh, triad as a foundation for the seventh chord, the three doesn't matter as much, but to make sense of what's happening on this beat, um, I think we have to look at this as an incomplete, half-diminished C-sharp chord. And I think that this is also where we modulate to the key of D major via this two chord that also happens to be 7-4-3 in the key of D major. And um, immediately afterwards we get a, a chord that sort of justifies that. We have F-sharp, A, A, and C-sharp, which is our three chord, F-sharp minor. And we know that 7, it goes to 1, it goes to 3. Those are the two general location it goes to. Most of the time it goes to one, but via the cycle of falling fifths, seven wants to go to three. So it's good that we're seeing three following the seven chord. It's alighting with the new um, key that we're in. We have some passing tones, or sorry, a neighbor tone in the bass and a passing tone in the tenor before we get A, C sharp, E, and C sharp. Another three to five progression here. And this is A major in root position with a passing seventh in the bass. And then we get F sharp, G, A, and C sharp. Um, however, I think this F sharp is, uh, yeah, this F sharp right here is an accented non-chord tone. And what we're actually getting is E, G, A, and C sharp, which is taking our chord and putting it in second inversion and adding a seventh. So this would be D7 over um, E, no, sorry, <laughs> D7 over E, A7 over E. Um, and then we get D major, D, G, A, and D, this G being a 
4-3 suspension over the base, of course, but still our tonic is implied. We have a resolution to our tonic triad on the next beat, neighbor tone in the tenor, and then we cadence on D major, D, F sharp, A, and D. This idea of the delayed cadence followed by two repetitious chords is something that Bach started right here. Or actually, no, he started it in the first phrase. No, he started it in phrase three and then continued it along into the, uh, into the B section. Now, very interestingly, we get a meter change here to 3-4, and here Bach does mix up the harmonic rhythm a little bit. Uh, we have to go sort of measure to measure and um, judge whether or not the harmonic rhythm is every beat or beat one and beat three or beat one and beat two or some permutation or yeah, permutation of uh, any of the three beats two or three beats of the measure, each getting a chord. So our first phrase is concluded with an imperfect authentic cadence in the key of D major. We have D, D, A, and F sharp, which is our tonic triad. No need to reanalyze. Oh, we skipped this D major triad too, so we don't need to reanalyze for three beats. We then get C sharp, E, A, and E. That's A major over C sharp, which is five, six. And then we get B, F sharp, A, and D. That's B minor 7 in root position, which is 6, 7. Another deceptive progression. And then we get C sharp, E, A, and E again, which is A major over C sharp, which is 5, 6. And then we have B, E, B, and E. So this is one of those measures that does not have harmonic rhythm. That is every beat. Um, thir third beat, however, is A, C sharp, A, uh, C sharp, and F sharp. So a bit of a deceptive progression here. This is F sharp minor over a sh uh, a natural, which is uh, three six. We then have B D D and G. That's G major over B, which is four six. Three going to four is a relatively normative progression. We see that from time to time. We have a passing tone in the alto as well. Another one of these measures that doesn't have a harmonic rhythm of every um, voice. You know, I think a general rule of thumb is that if you're looking in 3-4 and you're deciding what the harmonic rhythm is, um, if only two of the voices are moving, well, if only one voice is moving, there, I don't think there's a change of harmonic, I think the harmonic rhythm is 1 and 3, but if two of the voices are moving, that's when you have to start checking. It likely won't change the harmonic rhythm, it'll still be 1 and 3, but three, if three or more voices are moving, chances are the harmonic rhythm is every beat. Uh, so just look for the number of voices that are moving, that's what I do. Um, and also listen, see if there's a chord that's being introduced. But after our 4 6 chord, we get C sharp, E, B, and G, which is C sharp minor 7 flat 5 in root position, that's 7 7, and then we cadence on D major, D, F sharp, A, and F sharp 4 7 1, imperfect authentic cadence. Okay, looking ahead to the second page, I have to flip my notes over as well, we have very interesting sort of profile here. Let me get my notes off the frame. Sorry, there is a lot of paper for this particular corral. We lo looking over to the next phrase, we cadence in the key of E minor, but after this long tie right here, it feels like everything that's happening after the cadence kind of feels like a codetta, but because the cadence happens after everything that's going on here, I feel like it's more accurate to say that we have a, um, maybe like a plagal cadence or a deceptive cadence, I think is, uh, our, um, accurate as well if you feel like the cadence happens starting on the C major chord here. Uh, regardless, we're going to go back to the first page for a little bit to finish our analysis. We have a D, C, uh, sorry, D, A, remember this is treble clef, uh, D, A, D, and F sharp, which is very high A actually for the tenor to sing that. Um, this is D major in root position again, no need to reanalyze. And then we get A, C sharp, C sharp, and E. And I think from this point onwards, you could analyze in the key of E minor. But I feel like this is our departure point. It's more likely we have some passing tone. Uh, I just marked them as passing tones. This is an instance where we have a harmonic rhythm of every beat. So B, G, uh, B, and E, which is E minor over B. Another passing 6-4 chord in the middle of the of the phrase, which is very interesting. Uh, this is a 1-6-4 chord, and I think, uh, sorry, this is a 2-6-4 chord in the key of D major, but in the key of E minor, it is a 1-6-4 chord. I got a little ahead of myself there, apologies. And then we get C, F sharp, A, and E. That's uh, 
F sharp minor 7 flat 5 over C, which is 2, 4, 3, half diminished. And then we have B, G, B, and D sharp. Very interesting what's happening here. This is a G augmented triad over B, which is a 3 chord. That's augmented. That's what the plus symbol means. And then we add a 6 there to signify it's in first inversion. We then have A, F sharp, C, and D sharp. Now, kind of an interesting thing happening here. We can make the argument that this is a 7 chord that's happening here. A, F sharp, C, and D sharp. I mean, the, the notes are there and three of vo the voices are moving. But I feel like this is an instance in which we have harmonic rhythm on beats 1 and 3. That's just what my ear tells me. And also the fact that we have a 7 chord going to a 5-7 chord makes it feel like this entire phrase, or this entire measure, consists of um, a non-dominant chord going to a dominant idea. So you could make the argument that this is a 7-4-3 chord, D-sharp, uh, fully diminished 7th. So remember, not a diameter symbol, but the full degree symbol. Um, but I'm going to make the argument this A is a neighbor tone, and this C is an escape tone. Um, but here, the B, the F sharp, the A, and the D are the notes that are actually contributing to the progression. This is D7, another 3 going to 5, and that's what really led me in this direction of omitting the 7 chord from my final analysis. But the notes are there. If 7 going to 5 doesn't bother you, it doesn't really bother me. Um, but like I said, it, like I've said in previous videos, if you've watched my previous videos, 7 going to 5 or 5 going to 7, it's not really a progression. There's nothing progressing because the functions of the chords are similar. They're both dominant. Um, they both are driven by the leading tone wanting to resolve. So when you see one chord going to the next, it's usually in a rushed context or it's over a prolonged context where we're getting a lot of tension that is in dire need of resolution in the in the context of, you know, the tonal narrative that's uh, being uh, conveyed through the music. So I think this is 3 going to 5. You could say it's 3, 7, 5, like a transitive progression, because like we talked about earlier, 7 wants to go to 3, but 3 can also go to 7 using the same voice leading in reverse. So uh, that's going to conclude the first page of the chorale, and we are going to officially move to the back side, and remember we are going from a 5-7 chord to C major, C, E, G, and E, which is our 6 chord, a deceptive progression, and if you feel like that's where the cadence occurs, and this is more like a code, uh, like a codetta, like a little tag, um, that would be the argument that this is a deceptive cadence, but following our 6 chord we get B, E, G, and E, uh, which is uh, E minor over B, so another 164 chord, very unusual progression. And then we have A, F sharp, uh, C natural, and E, which is F sharp minor 7 flat 5 over A, or another 265 chord. And then we have E, G, B, and E. And in all of my times looking at the chorales, this is the second time that we have encountered a 2 to 1 progression. And I would be curious to go back and check to see if it's Yesu Nun Saik Preiset that um, includes this two to one cadence as well uh, because there's only one other chorale harmonization that I've looked at so far well, up until this point that has included a two to one progression and I think that falls under the jurisdiction of a plagal cadence but this cadence clearly is dynamic and has elements of deception as well so deceptive plagal it depends on where you mark where the cadence is actually happening does this C feel like the arrival point or does this E feel like the arrival point there's an argument for both I'll leave you to decide. I'll offer multiple analyses just to say that there are multiple perspectives out there. Okay, next phrase. So we have uh, a phrase here that ends in a, an imperfect authentic cadence in the key of D major, and I think we modulate straight away. We don't have instrumental interludes going on in between the phrases anymore, so uh, it's clear that the voices are operating in a concert with the instruments and we can say that the modulations are much more uh, we can say that the voices allude to the same things that the instruments would be doing unlike earlier where the instruments could have uh, set up a, a very clean transition to the key of A major rather than on the, on the page just looking direct and sudden uh, when that very well might not be the case but here this E minor chord is our 2 in the key of D major we immediately go to B 
D, B, and F sharp, which is our sixth chord, our submediant. This is another example of a transitive progression where the chords go against the cycle of falling fifths and ascent, and instead ascend up a fifth. Um, and here we get, uh, you could make the argument that this is a brief stint in the key of B minor, but I hear the phrase in the key of D major. The melody feels like F sharp, F sharp, E, D, which doesn't feel like 5, 4, 3 in D minor to me. It feels like 3, 2, 1 in D major. So uh, six of one, half dozen of another. It's entirely up to you. I feel like we're in D. But we get A sharp, C sharp, C sharp, and F sharp. That's F sharp major over A sharp. That's 5, 6 of 6, because F sharp is the dominant of B, and B is our 6. Um, this F sharp is a chord tone, this E is a passing 7th, another instance of where the harmonic rhythm is on beat 1 and 3. In fact, the entire phrase up until the cadence is going to be on beat 1 and 3, the harmonic rhythm that is. And then we get B minor, B, F sharp, B, and D, which is our 6th chord in the key of D major. We then have G, B, B and E. We're really getting a lot of absence of our tonic D major for being in the key of D major, but really I feel like the harmony is just disagreeing with the melody a bit here. That is to say that the, these chords are diatonic except for the secondary dominant, but the chords that are being implied here are diatonic to D major and uh, they're just building up the anticipation for the eventual resolution we get, which isn't too long. Um, here we have uh, E minor over G, which is 2-6, um, and then we have a passing C sharp here. Actually, you can make the argument that this is a 2-6 chord. Almost caught myself. You can make the argument that this is a 2-6 chord. However, I feel like this is C sharp diminished over G, C sharp, G, B, and E, C, or more specifically, C sharp minor 7 flat 5 over G, which is 7-4-3. And the reason why I feel this way is for a couple of reasons. One, six going to seven is very normative progression in the chorales. We typically expect a tonic triad to come afterwards, which it does, F sharp, D, A, and F sharp. Um, tonics are typically preceded by a dominant chord. I know that's not a super strong argument when we just had a cadence, a very, very rare cadence of two going to one, but seven going to one is a, a progression that we typically see multiple times per chorale. Um, that has been consistent across all of the chorales for the most part, so this is much more common. Um, and 2 and 7 are often presented in conjunction with one another, where we get 2 and 7 separated by one voice, and that voice is separated by a whole step. We have C-sharp versus B here, and you could make the argument that this is a 2 going to 7 going to 1 progression, but I feel like one voice changing really isn't enough to warrant in or just an entire chord progression. I feel like changing one voice makes us uh, have to look in between the lines here. And actually, if this were the case, B wouldn't even be an accented non known chord tone. It actually is a chord tone. It's just the C sharp that also needs to be lumped in to the picture here. Um, that isn't always the case, but sometimes it is. Um, but uh, Yes. Wait, that is because the B is doubled, right? Yeah, the B is doubled. In fact, it's more often than not the case. Uh, but yes, 7 going to 1. Uh, then we have E, D, B, and G. This D feels like a, you know, it's going to be like a 7-6 suspension over the bass, but actually it turns into a chord tone, which is very interesting. This is E minor 7 in root position. It's 2-7. This C sharp is a non-chord tone. This B is a chord tone, so we could leave it. We then have A, C sharp, A, and G, which is A7, incomplete, doesn't have an E in there, and then we cadence on D major, D, D, A, and F sharp. We get interesting chordal formulas and patterns in imperfect authentic cadences in comparison to authentic cadences, or perfect authentic cadences, where we typically have a couple of patterns that we expect, like 2, 6, 5, 5, 1, or 1, 6, 4, 5, 1, or just 1, 5, 1, or 4, 5, 1. Um, typical patterns and combinations that we expect, but in imperfect authentic cadences, we see inverted chords, we see interesting counterpoint where the 7, 6 suspension actually, you know, consists of chords that we would uh, not likely expect. But it's interesting here, we have this juxtaposition of here, this looks like a C sharp diminished chord to me, this looks like an E minor chord to me, even though you can make the argument this C sharp actually turns this into a 
seven, six, five chord, but seven going to five isn't much of a progression, and in the context of a cadence, two, five, one is just what we would expect. Um, I would hedge my bets and say it's the most common formula. Um, probably more than half of the time we see that type of, in, in an authentic cadence context, more than half the time, or around half the time. Okay, looking ahead, we have another phrase that has this interesting sort of plagal slash imperfect authentic. In this case, it's plagal versus imperfect authentic. I think it's a plagal cadence, um, but it's a counterpart to the phrase here where we have this long tie and then the cadence happens here. It really just depends on where you see the um, cadence happening. Does it happen? Is this the point of arrival or is this the point of arrival? Uh, but here we have D sharp, B, A, and F sharp. And I don't think this is a direct modulation. You could analyze it that way. It's just saying we're in E minor off the bat, but I don't think we have any reason at this point to think we're in E minor. You could even say this D major chord is a common chord as our subtonic seventh, but seven going to five doesn't really feel like, um, well, actually a subtonic seventh going to five feels more meaningful than like a leading tone seventh going to five because their functions are different. One is, um, not dominant and the other one is dominant so it feels much more like a progression but still uh, we don't know that we're going to the key of E minor until we get this D sharp introduced here so this very well could just be a tonicization and that's how I chose to analyze it. This is B7 over D sharp or 565 of 2 because we're still in D major here and that goes to 2 E, B, G, and E which is our um, supertonic E minor and this is where we go to E minor, it is now our tonic. We have passing tones in the inner voice, or sorry, not the inner voice, it's the bass and the alto here. And then we have G, E, B, and E, which is our tonic triad E minor in first inversion. We end up F sharp, F sharp, A, and D sharp, that's uh, D sharp diminished over F sharp, which is 7, 6. We have some passing tones in the bass and the alto again, I feel like this is just another series of measures, at least until we get to this measure here, um, where we have a harmonic rhythm of one and three rather than on every beat. But here we have A, F sharp, C, uh, a natural, and D sharp, which is taking our D sharp diminished triad and turning it into a seven chord and then changing the bass. So this is a seven, four, three. We could put the fully the full degree symbol before that too, I guess, to signify the fact that the the actually I feel like there should be some type of uh hold on let's let, let's actually figure out the figured base here. Um, so if we spell it in root position, we have D sharp to F sharp. That is the three. Um, no, spell it up from the base. If we go from A to F sharp. That would be a six. Oh, but the six is given if it's complete. That's what all of the seven chords are. All of the inverted chords have in common. So the six is omitted. Um, then we have A to C. That is a three chord, but this is flatted. I feel like there's something that we can do other than the flat here. The degree symbol, I feel like, articulates that as well. I feel like there's like a slash through the three or something. That might mean sharp. I'm not 100% certain, but still, seven, four, three. It's fully diminished rather than half diminished because half diminished would just be diatonic tones. The C natural is uh, actually, no, that's not true at all. The C natural is diatonic. We don't need to add that. Uh, C sharp would be um, something we would need to add there. Apologies. Well, we figured out that if this were an F sharp diminished or a D sharp diminished triad in the context of E major, where we would expect the C sharp, we'd have to put that flat there after the three. But here, no. C natural is diatonic to E major, or E, e minor, rather. Uh, so then we have G sharp, B, B, and E, which is our tonic triad in first inversion, and it's major. We have the Picardy third here, and whenever, whenever we get the minor four in conjunction with our major tonic, it's always very interesting. We have A, E, C, and E, which is, like I just said, our minor four, A minor. And then we get it respelled. A, C, A, and E. No need to reanalyze. And then we get our root position, E major triad, E, B, G sharp, and E, uh, our tonic. And this feels like plagal to me because four going to one is a plagal cadence. But if you see this seven, six going to one, six as our um, arrival point, 
then I think imperfect authentic is accurate. But um, these tag on contrapuntal cadences where it feels like there's content being added to the end of it. Um, yeah, it's, it's up to you. But looking ahead to our last phrase, we have another one of these faux phrases where the instruments play the end, but the voices end a few beats early. We end in a perfect authentic cadence, and I forgot to omit that extra D there, but still, it's like a perfect authentic cadence in the key of D. And I think this E major chord here is... Uh, actually, how is this E major chord functioning? I think we're going to make the argument that we have a direct modulation to the key of D major because of this juxtaposition of D natural, or the G sharp versus... We don't have a tone here that separates them, but the juxtaposition is we have E major, and we would expect to go to, um, uh, I don't know, maybe it would be 5 of 5 in the key of D major, but immediately afterwards we get uh, B minor, which makes this feel uh, very direct because the cross relationship comes from um, B major, which uses D sharp. And we don't we, we have D sharps throughout this phrase, but then we get D natural here. So the juxtaposition between the two is uh, there. But we also get G sharp versus G natural, separating the E major idea or the A major idea from uh, D major, which has G natural. So this feels more direct to me than anything else. Um, but this B minor chord has our six B D B and F sharp with a passing tone in the bass. We then have D, D, A, and F sharp, which is D major, our tonic triad with a passing tone in the bass. We have F sharp, D, A, and D, which is our tonic triad and first inversion. No need to change it. And like I've said before, this D kind of puts it in root position, but it gets rid of the third in the process, so we don't need to mark it as a modulation, or not as a modulation, as a uh, chord change or any analysis on the page. We then get a G, C, A, and E. Uh, I feel like because we would expect the chordal seventh to resolve down by step, um, it's likely that this G isn't necessarily an accented non-chord tone. We could call it 5-4-2, but I'm just going to call it 5, because the seventh doesn't operate the way we would expect. But I think 5-4-2 is also an accurate analysis, depending on how you look at it. If you look at it like our first beat, where the second beat is our non-chord tone, um, this A is still a chord tone, but this G would be considered part of the chord. For me, that's just not how I look at it. Um, this G right here also is our non-chord tone on the next beat because we get F sharp, D, A, and F sharp, which is our tonic triad, D major, and first inversion. We then get E, D, B, and G, another for, uh, root position 2-7 chord that has some non-chord tones going on. This F sharp is a non-chord tone, as well as this F sharp is also a non-chord tone in the bass. And then we get G, E, B, and G, which is taking our E minor 7 chord, putting it in root position, and adding a G to the bass. So getting rid of the 7th, putting it in first inversion. And then on this beat right here, we get E and D added in again, E, D, B, and G, which is just turning it into a root position E minor 7 chord again, so just undoing everything we just did there. We then have A, C, A, and E, sorry, C sharp, that's A major, and root position, which is our 5 chord. We would expect that to follow a 2 chord. Um, neighbor tone in the bass before we get A, C sharp, A, and E again. No need to reanalyze. Passing 7th in the bass before we get F sharp, C sharp, A, and E. Interesting deceptive progression here. This is F sharp minor 7 in root position. That's a 3-7 chord. This E is a chord tone, so we don't need to mark it. It's a neighbor tone. And then we have F sharp, D, A, and D. A very interesting progression when we have three going to one. Very unusual. Uh, but this is D major in first inversion, or 1, 6. Passing tones in the lower voices before we get A, F sharp, A, and D. That's D major in second inversion. So we'll just change the figure bass to 6, 4. Neighbor tones going on in the alto and the bass before we get A, E, A, and C sharp. We typically see 1, 6, 4 paired with 5, and we use this bracket here. It's a habit from class um, of so long ago. Uh, and then we have uh, passing 7th in the alto 
four we cadence on D major, D, A, F sharp, and D, and some versions have the bass uh, doubled. I don't know if that's actually something that is to be incorporated into the performance or if it's an optional thing or if that's what the continuum is playing. I don't know. But uh, I don't know, maybe there's someone who does know who has performed the music or knows how to interpret um, some edited versions of the chorales. I'd be interested to find out why some of them are doubled. Um, but that concludes today's very, very long analysis. I've been talking for 45 minutes according to my uh, timer here. Um, there's a lot to say about this crowd, but if really you want more emphasis about a particular portion, you should just rewind the video and watch it because I am spent. I'm losing my voice from talking so long without stopping. But lots of interesting chord progressions, lots of fascinating modulations, especially in the front of the chorale. We have like like really front loaded into this first portion of the chorale here. It's really fascinating. Um, but yeah, there's lots to study here, um, particularly this uh, F sharp minor to B minor uh, phrase here. Uh, very fascinating. Tons of fascinating stuff throughout a meter change. Lots of uh, relatively unprecedented things that we see occur in this chorale. And um, yeah, it was really fun to analyze. It took longer than usual just because of the content, but there was a lot to talk about, so I wanted to make sure that everything was uh, covered. Uh, but if you're interested in following me along on this journey to analyze all of the chorale harmonizations, feel free to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification icon. You'll be notified of when my daily video goes live, and um, if you want your daily dose of Bach, your daily fix of analysis, you're in the right place because you'll get it both from my videos. And there are hundreds of videos still to be made because I'm only 208 episodes in, so um, I think Bach, uh, there were 400 and 32 or 423. I always confuse the last two digits of the number of chorales that have survived um, the test of time. Uh, but regardless, more than 200 videos uh, left. I'm almost at the halfway point, which is crazy to think about because it feels like I have not been making videos for that long. But yeah, a chorale a day, you really get through it um, when you are as consistent as uh, a chorale a day regime is concerned. Um, but yes, on that note, uh, thank you so much for watching the video. It means the world to me. Uh, thank you so much for supporting the channel by doing so. It really means a lot. And I look forward to tomorrow's analysis. I hope you take care.